Welcome to another in the series of guest lectures on NASA's program and project management. Today, we will be discussing management issues as they have appeared in the manned spaceflight programs. Our participants are Aaron Cohen, director of NASA's Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center, Henry Pohl, JSC's director of engineering. I'm Joe Loftus, assistant director for plans at the Johnson Space Center. I'd like to begin our discussion by asking each of our participants to briefly talk about themselves. Aaron, would you briefly summarize your career since you graduated from Texas A&M and tell us a little about right. what you did before you became a manager? Okay, I, uh, after getting out of uh, Texas A&M, I, uh, went to, I went to the Army from 1952 to 1954, uh, and then from 54 to 58, I was with RCA, uh, Radio Corporation of America, and then from 58 to 62, I was with the uh, General Dynamics Corporation, and then in 62, I came to the Johnson Space Center. I had various jobs at the Johnson Space Center, uh, primarily in the guidance navigation area, managing that activity with the uh, uh, Draper Labs, an MIT instrumentation lab at that time, and then uh, deputy of the systems integration office. In um, the period of 1968 uh, to 72, I was a uh, command service module project manager, and then from uh, 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 72 to 82, I was the orbiter project manager. 82 to 86, I was the uh, director of research and engineering, and from 86 to the current time, I'm director of the Johnson Space Center. Thank you, Aaron. Henry, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I graduated from Texas A&M II. I was drafted and spent two years in service. <coughs> I started out as a test engineer on a Redstone in Huntsville, Alabama. I worked on the Jupiter, on the uh, Saturn. I got in some design work, designed the small rocket motors that were put in the wind tunnels up at Tullahoma. I came down here, I was subsystem manager on the RCS for Apollo. I was section head from about 64, 65, I can't remember when, to about 67. Uh, branch chief from 67 to 79, division chief from 79 to 86 in the propulsion power division, and uh, in 86 I became director of engineering. Very good. Aaron, would you briefly summarize what you think are the key things that a manager must do to achieve success? Well, I really think that one of the uh, key things is uh, have some, uh, in your career, have some early hands-on experience. But I think you have to start out with saying that uh, the key elements or the exact elements of managing, being a good manager of the programs of yesterday or yesteryear may not be exactly the same key elements of today. So I think you have to take, uh, you have to understand that. I think we have to start with that point. The new program managers, project managers, are going to have different pressures than the old ones. On the other hand, I do think there are some uh, factors that are common. One is, as I start off, I think uh, some early hands-on experience is important. Uh, whatever small project they may be, uh, to carry a project through, to see how drawings are, are, are made, to see how design, uh, a design that comes about, to see how parts are machined, how you process parts in the factory, uh, how you uh, do the testing. Uh, I think that's all very important. If a person can do that, I think you set a good foundation for a project manager. Of course, uh, that is, is one, one item I think that's important. The other item that I think is key, is very important, is uh, you need to be patient. Uh, you need to, uh, you need to uh, understand people and be people-oriented. You need to be able to communicate with people. Communicate with people both in, the, uh, in all directions, downwards, upwards, and laterally. You need to be able to communicate, be people-oriented, and uh, make people feel you want to uh, hear what they have to say. I think you have to be able to take criticism. You've got to be able to uh, take criticism and not become defensive and, uh, and uh, do that uh, type of thing. Uh, and I think you need to... Uh, Know, have to know when to uh, compromise. You need to know when to, uh, to compromise and, and get a solution rather than argue for a point that you feel that's wrong. So those, I think, are, are some of the, uh, the key elements that make up, I think, the, uh, 
the, the uh, attributes uh, in if programs for yesteryear and programs of tomorrow are some of the key elements, I think, in a, a person in becoming a program manager mm -hmm. or project. What are the major changes that you've seen in the management of NASA projects over the years? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, the two big programs that I managed was the, uh, the uh, Command and Service Module for the Apollo program, and Henry might want to add a little bit on this, and then the, the, uh, the Arbiter, the one in the 60s and one in the 70s. And I think if you had to say the, the differences are, are, the, uh, are you, the pressures you may have, the, both the, uh, the, a little bit from the external pressures, uh, if you go back to the Apollo era, I think the, uh, if you look at the Apollo program, I think you say the, the, the key thing you had to do was to uh, uh, look at uh, performance. I think performance was primary, schedule was second, and then cost. And I think those are the three elements, of course, of program management or performance, uh, schedule, and cost. And those are the three trade-offs that a program manager has to continually do. Uh, I think in the shuttle era, you still had performance, was still very key, is still, I would say, number one. But I think uh, cost was uh, overriding schedule. I think cost was more important than schedule. Um, in the space station era, I'm not sure I, I can tell yet. I think certainly uh, all three are still very important, and I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that all the pressures that the space station people are going to have yet come to bear. I think cost, uh, I think cost may uh, even override with schedule being second and maybe performance going on. Henry, you might want to add something to no, that. I, I agree with that. I think one of the things that uh, we, we've gotten into now is the lack of flexibility in cost. You know, Apollo, <coughs> we, we, we never had enough money in Apollo, but we did have a lot more flexibility in how we can use it than we have, uh, have oh, now. Oh, yeah, in Apollo, I would say that if you had a problem in Apollo, you, and you had a problem, you could uh, go multi-paths to get the solution and then pick the solution you wanted, but you could carry multi-paths for, for a while. In the shuttle program and the arm program, I think what you had to do in that case was to pick, pick the solution, not go parallel path, pick the solution you wanted and, uh, you know, with good judgment and good decision making, I uh, hope that decision was right, but not go parallel paths for that long. And I think that's one of the, uh, the differences. In the, in the shuttle program, you couldn't even continue a program. You had to start it and then oh, you had to right. stop it because you had to take those funds and transfer them someplace right. else and pick up. That's right. Uh, and get that one up up to the even keel and then uh, go back and pick up the other project and, and bring it along to uh, keep everything going along on the even, right. even keel. And I think the, uh, the uh, program of the, uh, of the space station era, there, there's going to be a lot of pressures. And I think if you can keep those fundamentals I talked about in front of you, I think you can uh, overcome those, uh, the new pressures that might come about. One of the things that has been talked about a great deal recently is organizational cultures. How would you characterize the NASA and JSC's cultures? Have they changed? Do they need to change? Well, I think, again, there's some very fundamental uh, things with culture. I think, uh, uh, I think that uh, at the Johnson Space Center, I think we have a, uh, a culture that uh, is, I don't know if you'd call it participant management, or there's certainly an interactive there's an interactive uh, activity, interaction activity that takes place in making a decision. Um, we have been left with the legacy that, uh, that if you have uh, an issue, that you have a concern, you feel free to express your concern. Uh, we weigh the problem, we work the problem, and if the, uh, uh, you may not always go the way people, the answer may not always come out the way people want it, but you're explained how you, what decision you make, and, uh, and uh, you go on from there. I think that um, the only culture change that I see that may take place is uh, maybe the, uh, the, uh, some external environment that says there are more external pressures in terms of uh, overview committees. But even then, if you go back in the early days, we still had a lot of overview committees. So I'm not sure I see a big change except for the one fact at the Johnson Space Center <coughs> is that we had previously had the one big program of uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. It would come up, then go away. Uh, today we have shuttle, and it's going to be with us for a long time. And we've got space station that's going to be with us for a long time. And then if we go on to the Lunar Mars Initiative, that's going to be with us for a long time. So I think the culture is going to have to be able to accept and adapt to how you handle large, multiple programs at the same time. Henry, do you have anything? 
Uh, well, there's a couple of things that I see that has changed uh, with time and is kind of changing back now. First, when we started out with Apollo, <clears throat> we had a few what I'd call mature people, and then we had a large number of people that's fresh out of college. When the shuttle program started, then we had that experienced team that went through the Apollo program. We learned an awful lot in the Apollo program. And now, as we start on space station, we're going to develop space station with a few mature people and a lot of young people again. So we're kind well, of going back I mean, toward I mean, uh, the uh, type of organization that we had in the early days. Well, let me ask you, Joe, what do you think? You've been, you've been, uh, you've been around. What's, what's your feeling on that? Well, I think. As you pointed out, JSC developed a very unique kind of culture. Uh, outside observers have characterized our decision making as being collegial and have had difficulty understanding uh, why we seem to be able to do it. But I think it's because we've dealt with issues that are very complex, very technical, and in which no one person had all the technical expertise yeah, yeah. to make a decision. So there was always this collegial discussion, and then the program manager, because he was the appointed decision maker, made the decision. Well, that's a good point, and I'm glad you brought that up. The, uh, uh, the, the program manager is like the board, chairman of the board. He has 51% of the vote, and I think that is the important thing, that the program manager has to recognize that responsibility, and he, you do have to give him 51% of the vote. Mm -hmm. Aaron, one of the things that might be interesting to discuss is why JSC uses a matrix management system. It was fashionable when we were formed in the 60s. It's no longer so fashionable in industry, but we still use it. Well, I think there's uh, several reasons why you basically use a matrix management. You use a matrix management uh, uh, for uh, one reason is if uh, you want a good check and balance on the program. That's one reason why you use it. In fact, I would say that was the reason why we originally used it, was because we wanted to have a check and balance of the various parts of the institution on the program. Uh, and that is a very good attribute to have. The other reason why you use a matrix management is because uh, you have multiple programs, and that's the way you handle multiple pro programs is going to matrix management. Now we're going into multiple programs, so we're going to have to use matrix management for that reason. But the original reason was more for the check and, check and balance. There are some disadvantages, as you know, of matrix management. You don't have the, uh, the uh, autonomy. The program doesn't have the complete autonomy. And as a project manager, I've got to admit, I, sometimes I was very frustrated with that. But I've got to tell you that as a project manager, I learned to love it. Because uh, you do have that check and balance. And I think that check and balance is important. Of course, at the Johnson Space Center, I think there's another reason why it could be very difficult for us to eliminate the matrix management, even though some places are getting away from it, is because we have the very intricate interweaving of our operations activity with our design activity. And I think that is probably the only way you're going to be really able to do that is with the matrix management system here at the Johnson Space Center. But I'm not sure all, uh, that fits all, all, uh, all organizations or companies today. No, oh, Henry, you have yeah, uh, I think, you know, in our situation, matrix management uh, gives us a great deal more flexibility to use the expertise that you have when you're not, you don't have a great deal of depth. You can use the experts on, on a lot of different programs. You can use them this week on this program, next week on this program, and next month on that program over there. As problems arise in each one of those, uh, those programs, they usually don't happen at the same time. And I think there's another message here about uh, <coughs> management uh, that any organization can work so long as it's the will of the people and the will of all of the people to want it to work. And I think that's one of the key ingredients to making an organization work. The best organization in the world will not work if the people don't want it to work. And I think that's one of the things that we've been able to do here is to keep everybody uh, with, with a sense of responsibility, a sense to, to, to want to do the job or feeling responsible for making the, the, the hardware work. And that's been a key ingredient to making matrix management work here at this center. Joe, I'd like to hear, again, I'd like to hear what you have to say, because I know you studied management systems for some time, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Well, I think that uh, 
as a government organization responsible for the initiation and the continuing management of programs, uh, we do not have as narrow and sharp a focus as you can create in a business enterprise. And I think the complexity of our task forces us into a matrix management. Well, that's the operations element that I was talking yes. about. In the context, then, of this management structure, how would you deal with the various elements of cost, schedule, and performance as they are embodied in the various functional elements that work with you? Well, uh, of course, you've hit the key of the, uh, of the whole program management uh, theme of the balance of performance, uh, cost, and schedule. Uh, that is a continuing trade. And that is the, you might say, that is the life a project a program manager lives with from the, from the conception of the program to its end. It's a continued trade-off. And uh, you, can never, uh, you can never solve, uh, you can not make everybody happy with, uh, you will never make everybody happy with those three elements. And it's a continued trade-off. You know, I used to use a, a very simple analogy when I used to, uh, used to work with people. They'd come to my office and I'd say, okay, now what I want you to do is help me. Uh, I would like you to uh, play like for a moment that you're in business for yourself and uh, you can't afford to, uh, to, give a b to uh, produce a bad product, so you want to you improve it. On the other hand, you're in business to make a profit and you can't afford to put all this money into it. Now, now help me figure out how to do that, how to get that product out on time. So I really think it boils down to that. The one thing though I think you can't afford to do in the manned program, and I think it's uh, true in the, in the unmanned programs too, is uh, you can't afford a, a failure. Failures are very expensive, and so uh, the safety and reliability and quality has got to be maintained in that. And so, and there's ways to do that. I mean, you can still balance off those three parameters and still get a very high quality, high quality product, reliable product, and safe product. So it is a tough job, and there is no closed form solution. There is by there. Let me believe me. There are is no closed form solution to uh, to that trade off. It is a continuing continuing trade of those three parameters. We've talked a good bit about engineering. Could you talk a little bit about how you use your program control and your business analysis people? Yeah, let me do that. And let me uh, do that in the c context of a, a term I, I uh, call avoiding pitfalls. Uh, if you go back and you look at the uh, history of program managers and project managers, the first pitfall uh, the, the first thing that happens is when you become a project manager, you have euphoria. You know, that's the greatest thing that ever happened to you. In fact, uh, my wife used to say the greatest thing that happened to Aaron is the day he became the orbiter project manager, and then from then on it was, it was really tough. Uh, but it is the euphoria you become. But then you've got to avoid the pitfalls. And the first pitfall you really have as a project manager is normally cost overruns. That's the first thing you normally see is cost overruns. The second problem a project manager pitfall the project manager has is schedule. And then you, you solve, normally you'll, you'll, you'll solve your, uh, they'll solve the, uh, the cost problem uh, by either replacing the project manager or some way figuring out how to do it, and then the schedule gets the, the, uh, is, is the problem you have to run into. And then, of course, it becomes the, the performance problems of getting it done and getting a good product. But getting back to your specific question, I think in that context, the project control is the important element in helping you avoid those pitfalls. Uh, you need to use your contract as a good tool. You need to have the project control office help you manage that contract. You need to have a good configuration control. You need, be, you need to be able to have them uh, give you a good budget estimate, uh, keeping up with your schedules. And if you do that, give you that insight, those are the ways, over and above the technical, as you pointed out, those are the ways that you can potentially, you have the best chance of avoiding those pitfalls. And I, I think it's an extremely important element of it. Engineering is good and is important, but believe me, the, the business management end of a, a program is vitally important to the success of a program. Henry, perhaps uh, you and Aaron could speak to the subject of what should be the proper relationship between the government engineering organization and program management organization and its contractors. Right. Yeah, but could I c come back to the last question for just a yeah. minute on program sure. control? Sure. You know, one of the things that you find about engineers is that engineers, for some reason, do not like to deal with budgets 
they do not like to deal with cost. They'll deal with schedules fairly well, but they don't like to deal with budgets and cost and frequently don't keep track of the effort that's being produced per length of time that they're working on it and their cost will get out of hand. And I think that's one of the key areas where a good pro program control office comes into play is they tend to keep the schedule, the budget, and, and, and the, the balance of the program in proper focus. Okay. You want me to take a shot? Let me, uh, let me answer that other question, because okay. I've been thinking about it while you... Uh, I think if you, uh, if you go back uh, to the uh, Apollo uh, 204 fire, and I, this thing always sticks in my mind, there was a statement in the, in the report that said that, uh, and I'll paraphrase it, that uh, the, uh, in, in doing space flight, uh, human space flight, you have to overcome a hostile external environment. And to overcome a hostile external environment, you need teamwork. So I think that's the theme. You need a teamwork between your, the contractor uh, and the government. I don't think there's any question about that, that you need teamwork. On the other hand, you need to uh, have an, a plan, an implementation plan, that you can award the contract, contractor when he does a good job, but you also need to penalize the contractor when he does a bad job. So I do think you need teamwork uh, and to get a good, safe, reliable, efficient product, but you do need a way to uh, penalize him when he doesn't do a good job and award him when he does do a good job. Henry? Yeah, the only thing I could add to that, Aaron, would be that, uh, that you both need a good understanding of the product that you're going to produce. You know, you, you, you both need to be working toward the same game plan. And, and, and both parties need to understand that very, very clearly. And I, that's what you mean by teamwork. Yes, but, that's right. Uh, but you, you got to have that. It's very, yeah. very critical. And also, to the teamwork, I mean the fact that uh, the way NASA operates, and I think that's typical at all centers, we do uh, pride ourselves, and I think we justifiably so, that we do have a, a technical capability and technical excellence. And many times, we have the te technical capability because of our facilities, because of the, the way we have done things, that uh, our technical capability, I think, and sometimes t tends to be in selected areas greater than some of our contractors. In some areas, our contractors have better te technical capability than, than we have. And I think we need to know how to utilize both of those to full advantage. That's especially true, Aaron, in those areas where we've had the opportunity to go through several programs sure. in okay. sequence, and then you got another yeah. contractor that's uh, new on a, on a street. Aaron, how would you like to talk for a moment or two to the subject of the relationship between the program office and the institution of the center itself? Well, uh, of course, with a, with a matrix management system, they're very intertwined. Uh, you know, you can always argue, are the programs here to serve the, for the institution, or is the institution here to serve the program? And I think it's, uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, I think that, uh, as we stated before, uh, there is a support from the institution uh, to the, uh, to the uh, program. If you look at the Johnson Space Center specifically, we have basically an engineering organization under Henry, we have an operations organization, and a science organization, and then we have the supporting functions. And those are all matrixed, you might say, support to the program manager. And as we said before, uh, he gets inputs from that, there's a check and balance where the institution does support the program manager, but you do have to say that the program manager, you have to give somebody that reign, and the program manager, if he fulfills the criteria I said I, that we start off this discussion on, he fulfills that criteria, he's justifiable in having 51% of the vote and making the right decision. Henry? I think I could even make a stronger case for the 51% for the because uh, if it was not for the programs, you would have little need for an institution because our total endeavor is in support of the projects or the programs at hand. And uh, it's a matter of how you go about doing it. Well, that's right. Aaron, um, it might be good to, to take a couple of cases in point. What was your most uh, trying decision during Apollo? Well, there were a couple, Joe, and then I'd like to, uh, you and Henry were there too, I, there were a couple. 
One I remember uh, very distinctly, uh, where, which I probably learned one of my biggest lessons from, was uh, I, 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 can't, I think the mission was Apollo 11, but I, and I think it was. Uh, they, there was an inertial measurement unit that was a little bit out of spec, not much out of spec, and uh, we were uh, we were thrashing around whether we should uh, re remove that inertial measurement unit. And uh, if you know, the lunar module was a pretty flimsy, uh, well, I wouldn't say flimsy, but it, wasn't a, it didn't have a very hefty structure. It was on the stack out on the pad. And we had to make a decision whether we should replace that inertial measurement unit or should we live with it. And, and we went to, uh, we talked about it a long time. We went to George Lowe and we really recommended, gave him all the data, but we came up with a recommendation that says uh, we really should not change that IMU out, the inertial measurement unit out. There's a risk in doing it. We can live with it. And uh, he thought for a moment and looked at us. He said, if, you can do, if we can remove that issue from the equation, we ought to go change it out. So I want to go change the IMU out. So that was a good point. That was a good, that was a good lesson that I, I learned and uh, always keep in the back of my mind. The other one was one, I, I think it was, I don't know if it was Henry or one of his people in the propulsion area that came to me and it was, well, that was on Apollo 8, where we had this issue on the injector of the SPS engine where we found that, uh, it's a long story, we found that uh, if you uh, fired the injector dry with both banks of the, of the, uh, in the engine, that you could have a detonation and essentially uh, cause a pressure spike and, and, and damage the chamber. And uh, one of Henry's guys, or Henry brought it to me, and, uh, and here we were ready to fly Apollo 8 to the moon, first time we ever left the Earth's gravity going to the moon. And uh, the way we were going to do it is we were going to fire uh, both banks of those engines uh, when we got into lunar orbit so we could uh, be sure we got into a, a good burn. Uh, and that could have been a bad, that's the way the process was set up. So these guys brought that to me. And I, uh, I got pretty excited about it. Here was the 11th hour and I had to figure out. But, but they came to me with a solution. They said what you could do is you could fire uh, on the way out, you could fire out a plane, just wet the bank one, with one engine, and as you go, fire the other bank with the other engine, get back in plane, not destroy your free return trajectory, and have both banks wetted so you can, then when you got, you could fire both engines, be safe. But I was the one who had to call George Lowe, tell him about that at the Cape. And that was an interesting experience, and I did that. And, uh, but I think the message there was that, and I think there's a very key message there, and I think that's probably one of the most important, th important lessons to learn and that is that you should, a project manager or a manager should give the feeling to the people that he works with that they can bring him problems and they can bring him any kind of problem and that he's willing to understand that and work with them to, to a, a solution. And so that was a very healthy situation. I think if you can instill that type of, of uh, feeling amongst all your people, I think uh, you'll be very successful. Henry, how do you try to create that sense in your subsystem managers? Uh, you do it by giving them a feeling of responsibility, that it is their responsibility to make absolutely certain that their hardware is going to fail. It's going to work. If they feel like it's going to fail, it is their responsibility to bring it forward. And it's not always pleasant. One of the most difficult things sometimes is going in to tell your boss something that you know your boss is not going to like. I, uh, I can remember when, <coughs> this, excuse me, one night uh, they called me at home about 11 o'clock at night and told me they had a pop in the uh, command module when they were servicing the RCS. And I was up there a few weeks before and the tanks were creaking and popping and I didn't think too much about it, but next morning I walked in and told my, one of my engineers that they had a pop in the uh, tank. He said, shoot, they pulled a standpipe in two. He says, I just ran those calculations last week. They pulled a standpipe in two. That was the one where we pulled the command module up, went yeah. in and replaced the yeah, tank I on it. Uh, like that, that wasn't a pleasant thing <laughs> to have right. to go forward and tell somebody that we thought they right. pulled a standpipe in two with no way to get in there. And sure enough, they did. They pulled right. it in two. But that, that is a good, that's the right way to I can give you another, if you got just a sure. 10 seconds, another good example. On the RCS tanks, they were made out of titanium, 28 days into a 30-day test, one started leaking, very small leak. They cut that piece out, analyzed it, said it was caused from a fingerprint. That paper came across my desk, I looked at it, it looked fine. I signed it, sent it on its way. 
sent one of the engineers out to uh, look at those tanks. He came back, says, Henry, we can't let them get away with that. That was not a fingerprint. I said, why? He said, it'd take a monkey to get in there, put his finger in there. Make a long story short, we went and put 10 tanks in test after much arguing over it, but he wouldn't give up. Every day he came in, at least once, he says, Henry, we have to do something about that. That was not a random failure. And so finally I got the nerve to go forward and tell the program manager that we had a problem. And when I did, uh, we got 10 tanks in test and 98 hours into test, three of them blew up, just broke wide open. Of course, then you didn't have to worry about it anymore. We fixed it. But it is through his integrity and his concern and him not letting it die that kept us from having a problem on the first uh, Apollo, Apollo flight. And somehow that needs to be reinforced <clears throat> every day of every week. You know, if you don't do your job and you don't do it good, the bird won't fly. And so I see that as one of our major jobs as, a, as managers is to convince the people that we're working with every day that it's their responsibility to understand their hardware and if they see something that they feel is not right, bring it forward right. and talk about it. If you don't get the answer you want that day, you bring it forward again and try to convince the people that you're right in the final analysis, if that, after you do that two or three times, then you go back and you do it the way that you've been directed to do it. But you make every effort to convince them that you're right. We've taken some examples from Apollo. Do you have one or two similar cases in well, the shuttle program? Well, yes. Uh, um, of course, uh, the thing we didn't talk about, uh, which I think is important, is decision making. And uh, decision making is uh, very important. Uh, time, and timely decision making is even more important. And that, and by definition, I don't, by timely decision making, I'm not, I don't really mean that you have to make a decision right away. It's got to be timed properly. Sometimes it's right away and sometimes you wait. And sometimes you don't always have all the information you need to make the decision, but sometimes you need to make the decision uh, without all the information. And the fact that you've, uh, the fact that you've made a timely decision, the fact that you waited, you have a good chance to uh, be right. Uh, a couple of items in the, in the uh, uh, orbiter program that uh, come to mind. One was, uh, one was uh, early in the program, we had to decide uh, what type of landing system to use. And it was a technology issue, uh, which uh, we were going through in terms of what was the right technology to pick. And we were looking at that time back in the uh, 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 early part of the program, the 72 uh, time period, whether we should go with the microwave landing system. Now, that t it, making the decision today would be pretty straightforward, but in that time period, it was pretty hard to decide whether you should go with the microwave landing system. And I didn't have all the information. You know, I, I didn't have it, but I, th I thought it was timely to do it. And uh, we, I didn't really want to pay the money to pick up all the technology development uh, and take that risk. On the other hand, the performance looked awful good. So uh, weighing that, I made the decision to go with the microwave landing system, and it turned out to be the right decision. Uh, we went with it. It's been very successful, and uh, it's, it's been one of our better systems. Another one is uh, we were arguing one evening about uh, uh, that reversed on me. This one was a good decision. Uh, we were arguing one time about the number of structural test articles we needed, and my budget was pretty tight. And the engineering people came in and said we needed, I forgot how many structural test articles, and. And I looked at the budget that it would cost to do that, and I said, no, we're going to cut, cut the five of them, three or four or five or something like that. Uh, and I made that decision. Now, it turns out that it was uh, a timely decision. They came back to me about uh, two months later, and they really had a, a very good technical briefing of why, technically, from a safety point of view, they really needed the added articles, and I put them back in the program. And didn't hurt anything because I didn't make a timely decision and was able to pick up those added test articles. That ties in two things. One, the people weren't afraid to come back, as Henry pointed out, to tell you that you were wrong. And number two, uh, I made a timely decision, which gave me time to, uh, to uh, fix the problem. So I think there's two ends of the, the spectrum. And I think, Aaron, that's one thing that we have to be um, constantly balancing against a correct decision. 
you know, sometimes we can get in the trap or mode of feeling like uh, we might make a mistake. And a lot of times, the greatest mistake of all is not making a decision. Well, I think that's right. And I do think uh, the other thing is I think you have to be uh, re able and uh, be able to accept the criticism and the fact that you made a bad uh, decision and reverse yourself if you have to. I think that's another Absolutely. important characteristic. We've talked right up until now about the details of managing a project, but both you and Henry have also managed line organizations, and I'd like you to comment on what you perceive as the differences in the management of a line organization versus a project. Well, uh, there are a lot of similarities. There's no question there are a lot of similarities in managing the project and, and managing a line organization. Uh, I think the biggest difference, as I see, and I'd like to hear what you have to say and Henry have to say after I finish, but I, I think the biggest difference I see in managing a line organization that it does take a lot more time with your people in a line organization, certainly as center director and certainly as a director of research and engineering, than it does in managing a project. Uh, it takes a lot more time. You still have trade-offs as managing an institution versus managing uh, a project. It's not as strong on uh, uh, cost and schedule and performance as much as it is on param other parameters, but like parameters. So there's a lot of similarity. And I think the fundamental, but I do go back to say to you that the fundamental, uh, that way that we start off this discussion, the fundamental characteristics I think are about the same. Henry? I think you're right, uh, right on here. And uh, the, uh, the major difference that I see between being a project manager and, and being a director of a line organization is that you have the administrative responsibilities of your people as a, in a line organization where generally a project manager spends very little time in the administrative responsibilities with their people. First off, they, they don't have a large number of people that they have to supervise directly. They have a lot of people that support them, but they don't have to worry about the administrative uh, part of it, and that's a large part of trying to keep the spirit up, the, uh, the, the can-do attitude up in an organization, and that responsibility for Paul's well, large online organization. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think uh, Henry's point uh, is the one that comes to my mind, is, is that line organizations, management's primary responsibility is the development of their people. And the people are then used to support the programs. So it's, a, it's much more of a, a paternal kind of management as opposed to a objective yeah. achievement kind of management. What do you see to be the, the most significant issues that we're going to face in the next five to ten years, Aaron? Well, uh, I think uh, as far as uh, NASA is concerned, NASA specifically, I think we need to uh, uh, continue to maintain our technical excellence. I feel that we need to continue to uh, uh, bring on good people. Uh, we need to continue to train our good people. We need to give them the right uh, 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 working environment in terms of uh, facilities, in terms of laboratories. Uh, we want to stay a technically proficient organization. And I think that's probably the, the fundamental thing for all NASA centers. Uh, we want to uh, be sure they have the right uh, uh, capability to uh, maintain their educational proficiency, their formal education, whatever field it may be. I think that's important. Uh, I think we need to uh, as you and I personally have talked many times, I think we need to have successful programs. Uh, I think failures are very uh, devastating, and we need to be able to uh, maintain the momentum, whether it's a, a, an un, unmanned program, whether it's a manned program, we need to have successful programs, and we need to, to minimize our, our, our risks. Our, our, our failures. On the other hand, we can't be afraid to do something. We've got to be bold. We've got to be aggressive. Uh, so we can't let that uh, shadow uh, the way we do things. 
So I would say those are, to me, the most significant challenges that we have in the future. The other, I guess the final point is with the advent of the thing I talked about before, multiple programs, large programs, things we'd like to do in the future, I think we need to become even more uh, productive than we, are, we have been in the, in the past. And that's in all areas. Henry, what do you see as the major issue? I agree with Aaron totally. Uh, there's two, two key areas. One is developing confidence and, and maintaining confidence in our people. You know, you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to be able to know where you're coming from in order to direct and manage a program. And that takes time to develop, especially with the young people. I would say five, seven, eight years to develop that confidence in themselves. And I think we, we've been blessed with that. I also think that we have to continue to look at more efficient ways and better ways of doing business to eliminate duplication. It is not possible for us to continue doing business the way we are and support all of the programs that's on the plate and do all the things that we are to be doing. You know, we're just now to the point of where we can make space a fun place to work and play in. And there's a lot more work out there that needs to be done than we can get around to. So I see that as the two major areas that we have to work on. Aaron, what should young engineers or other professionals just starting out on their careers in NASA do to prepare themselves for positions in management? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, whatever their field is, as you pointed out, uh, whether it be in the business management area, whether it be in the uh, human resources area, or whether it be in the technical engineering science area, operations area, I think you need a good formal background. I think you cannot get away from a good formal background uh, in education. I think that's extremely important. Uh, I think as we start off this discussion, I do think uh, trying to get some early hands-on experience in a total systems aspect of a, of a program is very beneficial. And I think that ought to be in the hardware area if you can and even in the analysis area if you can or some, some type of hands-on experience, whether it be in the engineering area, science area, operations area, or even in, as I said, the human resource or business management area. I think it's very important to get hands-on and start it from the ground, the ground up. So I think that's extremely important. And I think uh, the other attributes, as I said before, uh, the patience, the integrity, honesty, uh, and being able to communicate are the, really the attributes for a young person if he wants to, to, uh, to uh, uh, make it happen, you might say, in a successful program management uh, arena. Henry, would you want to comment on? I'm not too sure I can add a whole lot to what Aaron uh, uh, came up with. I usually can always find something to add to something. But <laughs> uh, that's, the, uh, that's the key things, that uh, the, you have to develop confidence in yourself. And one way a person goes about doing that is being able to take a project and do it. So you get a feel for what it takes to do that job. And then you get a feel for what it takes to do a little bit larger job and a little bit bigger job. And I'm a firm believer on a person starting out at the bottom in an organization and learning the trade and working the way up through the, uh, through the system. And I think it's those first years, the foundation that you get during those first few years that's extremely crucial to doing a good job having the uh, tools to do a good job down there. Let the me road. tie you into this, Joe. You've been around a long time. What, uh, you've, seen, you've seen it all happen. What, what's your take on it? Well, uh, I think I'm a subscriber, as you and Henry are, to the early hands-on experience. And I think there's a reason for that in the sense that uh, once you have become expert in something yourself, when you move into positions where you deal with subjects that you're not so knowledgeable about the content, you have learned how to recognize the work of an expert because it has characteristics or tool marks and it helps you in evaluating the decisions you have to make. We've talked about our relationships with the contractor and within the various elements within the center. 
one of the things that it might be worthwhile to talk to Aaron about program management as we're doing it in the station is our relationships with our headquarters and our sister right. centers. Well, I think that's a good point. I'm really glad you uh, addressed that. I think uh, it gets back to really what I said before, an item I said before is teamwork. Uh, there's no question that uh, teamwork is really, uh, is really the element, of, I guess, the un underlying element of all success. I think we've got to have teamwork uh, with our, uh, with our uh, centers, with, with, with the centers within NASA. And we certainly have to support the, uh, the uh, pro program directors and the uh, associate administrators and headquarters because they are really the uh, people that are, are uh, setting the stage for the whole program, and I think uh, we need to have teamwork with them and for them and with the centers. I think that's extremely important. And I think I've seen that uh, come a long way. I think we have come a long way in that regard. I think we all recognize that's going to be the element of success of both our uh, manned programs and our unmanned programs. And I, I think we're, we're demonstrating that more and more every day with the leadership we have of the center directors and the uh, associate administrators and with the administrator and deputy administrator. So I think it's extremely important. Henry, how do you see the relationship amongst the various directors of engineering at the centers? Uh, I, I don't know quite how to answer that because I don't know how it used to be <laughs> that, that good. But uh, I tend to agree with Aaron that uh, the thing that uh, we have to have is honesty, integrity, teamwork. You know, you got to have those three and you've got to have a sincere desire to try to do what is right for the program. You know, you, you can't let too many other things creep in and uh, as long as we can keep our focus on trying to figure out what is really the best thing to do and get on and do it and make a decision. You know, I think that's one of the most important things that we can, we can do. Aaron, I think uh, we've covered most of the points that come to my mind as to what one should address in program and project management, but perhaps you would like to uh, summarize what you think of as the key tools that the manager has to achieve his objectives? Well, the, uh, the one thing that a manager uh, uh, doesn't like, or two things a manager doesn't like, uh, one is a, a surprise and the other is a failure. Uh, and that surprise could be in uh, the budget area, the schedule area or the uh, performance area, and the same thing with the failure, whether it be a test failure or whether it be uh, uh, something more significant. So I think the, the, uh, the, with those underlying uh, issues and those underlying uh, uh, stipulations, I think you have to have the intelligence and the uh, staying power, you might say, which is uh, what I would say is almost a 24-hour a, a day, seven-day-a-week job to keep on top of those parameters so that you don't get surprised, you don't have a failure, and it's just by working the details, have people that are willing to bring you those, that information and have people that are willing to help you make those decisions, whether it be your, uh, your, uh, your own people or your contractors uh, that help you make those decisions. So I think if you can, if you can set that type of work, if you, can, if you can put that type of energy into it, and you can get that type of people around you, not have yes people around you, but have people that will bring you the problems and bring you the uh, potential solutions, I think you've got a very, very high probability of, of avoiding uh, the pitfalls of, uh, of the type of things that would cause you to, uh, to fail. Henry, do you have any further comment? A program manager's got to be tough as nails. I mean, you, you, you've got to... You, you've got to not feel intimidated or not let the system overwhelm you. There's lots of decisions that are tough, tough decisions. Decisions that's going to make absolutely no one happy. That has to be made and they have to be made in a timely fashion. And it takes someone with a great deal of fortitude 
to be able to make those decisions and make them in a, in a timely, uh, a decisive kind of a way. And I think that's one of the most important ingredients that a project manager has to have that tends to differentiate a project manager from a, a, a director of engineering or division chief or some of those other kinds of jobs. There's lots of unpopular decisions that has to be made, and someone has to make it, and that decision generally falls on the project manager. For our last observation, Aaron, I'd like to address you to address the question that says, uh, we're losing the generation that has had this experience of Mercury, Gemini, Skylab, Apollo, shuttle, and uh, some people express a concern as to whether we will have the management capability and depth as we go into the future. Well, I think uh, we are losing, uh, we have lost a, a lot of people in that regard. The uh, time uh, has caught up with us in that regard, or time has caught up with some of the people. On the other hand, I really uh, think from a uh, more positive point of view, I think uh, that uh, we do still have uh, a lot of people around. Uh, good people around. We do have uh, education programs. We do uh, recognize, I think, the key elements of good program management and the key elements that are going to require a person to have the tools to be a good program manager or a good engineer or a good scientist or business management. I think we recognize those. And I would say this. I would say that the people that I see, the young uh, men and women coming out of the universities today, uh, I'm pretty high on them. I, I look at what uh, some of the young people we've hired, and we're hiring quite a few, as I'm sure all centers are. Uh, I think uh, I have no question in my mind, uh, I really have no question in my mind, that they will be able to step up to the challenge of the large new programs that I hope that, uh, that we're working on that will come to pass in the future, which I think will come to pass in the future. And I just have no question in my mind that we're going to have the right people. We've got the right attitude. We've got the right leadership. All the centers feel that way. So I just, I feel that if we keep going down the path we're going, with the emphasis we have, that we'll have the capability to do the big programs of the future. Henry, would you like to comment? I tend to agree with Aaron 100 percent. I think we need to remember that we went to the moon with a young team of people. You know, we had a few experienced people and a lot of kids out there, and not a one of them let us down. The ones that we're getting today are the country's finest. You know, they're much better educated than we were. They have a much better foundation to start out. They work just as hard. They have the same kind of worth ethic that we had. And I think when the time comes for them to take over this responsibility, they will not let the country down. I'm confident of that. I don't think you can give them too much responsibility too quick right now. Aaron, Henry, thank you very much. And this concludes this discussion of program and project management in a manned spaceflight program setting. Thank you. Thank you, and goodbye. Okay.